Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. Uh, yeah, I want to talk to you about the date industry. It's uh, very much a new but emerging industry. Um, but, but why dates? Perhaps before um, I, I, I talk so much about the dates, uh, I might give you a little bit of background to, to, why, to why it was that we actually decided to grow dates. So yeah, as, as Vanessa said, we run a, a horticultural property in the Riverland. We're um, about, I think I've got a pointer here, about 40 kilometres over the Victorian border, uh, 150 kilometres from Mildura, 250 kilometres from Adelaide in a semi-arid area. Perhaps uh, I think we're at about 11 inches of annual rainfall. We started out growing uh, vegetables, pumpkins, um, and we progressed on, moved on to, uh, to wine grapes. And uh, we're, we're really first generation farmers. I came down from Alice Springs and we set up in this magnificent area called the Gurra Gurra Wetlands. And the first year we were down there, uh, 19, uh, 1989, from there through to 1993, we had seven floods in, in five years and it was absolutely magnificent. Yabbies and fish jumping out the river at us. Uh, but this very large wetland, which is uh, I think the third largest in the, in the riverland, 3,300 hectares, then went through a dry cycle. 17 years without a flood. And what that meant is that we had um, very saline conditions. In fact, at, 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 at our worst, we were up to 5,500 EC units. I think the main, the main Murray River at that same time were, was about 300 EC units. So there was very, very good water in the, in the Murray River, but because the Gurra wetlands didn't have that flood through, we actually started to run into bad salt problems. 17 years, it changed our environment going from those health, healthy red gums to uh, what you can see behind me there. But it wasn't just the change environmentally that changed our thinking, it was also what happened to our agricultural pursuits. Wine grapes. We'd get our fruit right up to about January, with uh, February, February being our harvest date, and uh, that's what would happen. You know, the, uh, the, the vines would just, you know, they'd take up the salt and Oh, we'd usually have to ring around, we'd have four or five wineries coming out and you know the first two or three would reject them because of the salt load and so, so it was a bit of a challenge and, and we really needed to make a decision, you know, what we were going to do. And uh, I guess at that point in time, uh, married, uh, you know, with four kids and a mortgage, uh, the decision was do we, uh, do we roll the swag and move on or, or do we uh, dig in and uh, see what else we could do. So it was really at this point we started to research salt tolerant crops and um, we, we looked at that for a number of years and we, we tried to look at other semi-arid areas around the world and you know we just kept coming back to date palms. They were so undeveloped here in Australia but it really is a large international commodity. So that was the process and our thinking behind moving our main process now to um, our main uh, objective now to growing table dates. One of the other challenges we have in the, re in the Riverland is uh, extreme temperatures. And it happened, I think it happens probably nine out of 10 years. You know, the early uh, spring flush and we'd have uh, a heat wave. This photo is Shiraz this year. I think it was somewhere about the third week in November and we hit 45 degrees and, you know, 20% wipeout due to sunburn on, on the grapes. And that's not uncommon, that happens each year. So we had the salt, we had the extreme temperature issues. So that's why we just kept coming back to date palms. We did a lot of looking at them, um, trying to analyse the matrix in which they needed to grow and looking at markets uh, and, and trying to decide for ourselves whether this crop was going to be suited to us. Our, um, our conclusion was that you know, a tree can produce around about 100 to 150 kilos of fruit. It's a high value crop if you've got the right varieties and it's adapted to uh, many different climates. So we, uh, we made the decision that we would go on and, um, and, and, and devote our lives to it. So that's a, a little bit of uh, how, how a plantation um, would look and, and, and we actually, we enjoy the look of a plantation. I mean, our district in the Riverlands changed. When I first moved down in uh, 1980, 1989, our, uh, our horticulture landscape was, you know, sultanas, wine grapes, stone fruit, large citrus. And that sort of got superseded in the, in the coming years because uh, the wine grapes dominated and the, the, so the landscape in the Riverlands basically wine grapes. And to, to bob up with um, a, a tree crop that looks absolutely magnificent uh, also had appeal for other reasons other than agriculture. You know, it helps us market the fruit because we have uh, a lot of visitors, um, agro-tourism. 
um, and also um, adds fantastic environmental benefits. Uh, wind erosion, uh, you know, we don't have problems with that. Um, but when we looked into the, into the fruit, and, and really at the end of the day, they're a, a very attractive tree, but the industry has to be market driven. Unless there's a dollar in it, you know, we don't, we don't want to participate in it. And, and we had a look at what, what's available in Australia in terms of um, product and what's available in other countries. And due to the very, very strict quarantine control measures with dates being imported into Australia, we identified that in international markets there's three market segments. There's fresh dates, which this photo shows, and then there's dry dates, or ripe dates, and then there's cured dates. And the Australian marketplace is um, possibly familiar more so with the dried and the cured dates because being 30% moisture or less, aqueous allow them to move into the country. But there is huge markets for these fresh kalal dates and they're available in a lot of different colours and flavours and textures. And, and we identified from that that this is a market segment that's just not available in Australia. Most Aussies, Anglo-Saxon based Aussies, would never have seen this product before. It's not, it's not here. Um, we do field a lot of inquiry from uh, expats from various countries um, that, that are familiar with this product and we, we actually get bombarded with requests for this product so we, we also had that to support our ideas in going forward. So a little bit about the international industry. Production uh, which is around 7 million metric tonnes over 930,000 hectares occurs in 40 countries. Now. They're just numbers, but for myself trying to put that into context, I, I looked at what I thought was a large industry and is a large industry with um, a combination of olive oil and table olives that am amounts to 5.5 million metric tonnes. So 7 million metric ton tonnes of date production is, is, is very large through my eyes. The other factor there is that more than 93% of the production of dates are consumed within the country of origin. So there's some countries that are geared up for export, but the majority of countries only produce basically what they consume themselves. 98, actually I think it's closer to 99% of production occurs in the Northern Hemisphere. In recent years, there's uh, perhaps as, as recently as 15 years ago, an industry has been initiated in South Africa and Namibia. So we do have some competition, particularly for those fresh dates, which have amazing opportunities we believe for export because being counter seasonal to the northern hemisphere it does give us a, a chance to move that product into a market where there isn't that um, oversupply. Um, we looked at what's occurring in Australia and, and really um, less than 50 hectares and less than 20 tonne of annual production uh, and yet there's 7,000 tonnes or thereabouts imported each year into Australia. So we think there's, there's domestic uh, market appeal uh, and, and that's really without promoting the product. So we, we think there's good um, opportunity for domestic and export. So we, we really made the decision in 1996 that we would move into dates. It took us a number of years to be able to, to travel around, identify varieties, um, actually make, uh, to put in place steps that we needed to, to coordinate the importation of those varieties and it wasn't until 2001 that my wife Anita and myself uh, managed to import the, um, the first in vitro um, plants and uh, away we went. So the, from tissue culture which we knew very little about at the time so we went back through to the Adelaide University and spent a couple of years there um, getting private tuition to understand the processes. We built a very resourceful tissue culture laboratory at our home property and um, learnt the processes of subculturing. So it was through those processes that we made uh, actually some horrible and expensive mistakes earlier, but just kept on uh, putting uh, processes in place to correct those mistakes. And it takes around three to four years to take an in vitro plantlet through to a size big enough for field planting. So it is, um, it is a big commitment, but fortunately um, we had a bit of success and then understanding that the limitation to the future development of the Australian date industry was actually accessing disease and pest free elite genetic material, understanding that that was the reason why the Australian date industry wasn't progressing, we actually started to import plants in excess of what we needed for our own expansion plans. And 
without doing a lot of advertising or, or, or pushing the product, basically we somehow, um, people heard about what we were doing and we started to field inquiries with people wanting to try date palms in different locations. So now those dots, dots on the maps represents where we've sent date, plant, uh, date palms to. Um, they would represent very small plantings but at least we've got now some feedback from a network of growers to give us a geographical footprint of what varieties go well in different regions. We've also probably um, uh, progressed that on a little bit more to um, work in with, um, we've got a plantation now in Sunraysia at TAFE, working in with the Government of Victoria, and also later this month, uh, the Northern Territory Government, we're, we're putting some more varieties up there for evaluation. And also we're doing something similar in Western Australia. So what we're hoping to do is set up a, a trial site on, on, on each major area where we see dates can be grown uh, so local growers can, can actually see varieties working in their neighbourhood. So after the nursery stage, we uh, plant, planted out uh, different varieties. We're actually we're up to 25 varieties. Uh, these varieties originate from Saudi, um, UAE, Iran, um, Iraq, uh, Morocco, uh, North Africa. And basically what we've done is researched the market and we've identified the highest premium dollar value. Uh, that's attracted our attention. And then we've looked at the cultural notes um, and, and on-site plantations in, in the Middle East. And we've looked at yields and ease of management and uh, specific to each um, variety and we've really tried to target those varieties and, and get them into the country. So we're at a stage now where uh, the earlier varieties that we imported in 2001 are at fruit bearing age and uh, subsequently we've had fantastic support from Reddick. They um, uh, joined our program in 2008. Uh, the varieties which they've helped uh, us get into the country and subsequently extend field trial siting um, uh, sites uh, they're not bearing fruit yet, but we're starting to get some important data now on, on vigour and performance, even at a younger stage. And uh, yeah, so that's my son, Sean, and it's just getting, uh, it's just starting to get exciting for us now. You know, we're starting to pick dates and uh, starting to evaluate where we're going and, uh, and, and how that's shaping up. It's also led to other opportunities. We realise we're dealing with a pretty tough plant. And uh, over the time, these are some of the projects that have accidentally fallen our, fallen our way. This is a grower in, um, in uh, uh, Loxton North who has mandarin. You can see him in the background, but his issue is poor drainage because of uh, perch water tables due to over-irrigation, regional over-irrigation. So um, his decision was, do we put in expensive drains? Um, no, we planted date palms. They're unirrigated. They're mopping up that groundwater table for him. And uh, so he's looking at a secondary crop as well as r reducing that water table. Uh, we've, we've had industrial uh, wastewater users um, contact us. Um, we work in with the largest winery um, in, in our region. They have something like 300 megs of wastewater. And they've been running um, a, a very tight program in trying to utilise wastewater. You can see there in the woodlot, the eucalypts just aren't performing, but the date palms are, are going very, very well in this location, and we're actually just um, able to demonstrate a potassium export offsite each year, which is the winery's biggest um, hurdle with the um, environmental protection agencies. Um, we've planted um, date palms up at Lake Eyre, where we're irrigating them with great artesian water, uh, 5,500 EC um, units, uh, calcium-based salts. You can see the salt on the ground there and um, the date palms are thriving, even in a very harsh environment. We work with indigenous communities, uh, helping them uh, get, get plantations up and, um, and, and helping them where we can there. So that's a desert uh, location in the Northern Territory. So basically what, what we can conclude by our own experience and what we've seen in our travels is that uh, they can tolerate extremes in temperature. Uh, they're very salt tolerant. In fact, um, at 17,000 EC units, we can expect a 50% yield loss. They're drought tolerant. So where we've had in the Riverland water turned off, our uh, citrus and our uh, table grapes and our uh, stone fruit, etc. If we do have to turn the water off date palms, they won't melt. They'll be there. We don't lose our investment base. Of course, they won't yield fruit. They do re rely on irrigation for fruit production, but we can fire them up again. The date industry has the capacity to produce highly nutritious food in challenging in clim climatic and environmental conditions where a lot of other crops will melt. 
I was very, very fortunate that in um, 2012 I was awarded a Nuffield Scholarship. Um, great, um, very grateful for Woolworths to sponsor that one for us. And that allowed, uh, that allowed uh, us to travel through some of the date growing uh, areas, looking at some of the new world and some of the old world models on growing dates. Um, managed to um, go to England and, and look at what they, they've been running a, a date breeding program for 20 years. Visited California, uh, my wife and uh, youngest son uh, joined me on that trip and, and that was fantastic. We pulled a lot out of the American date industry uh, because they've really developed a lot of mechanisation and they're actually expanding as the world is, um, huge date plantations going in and it really gave us a big confidence boost. We looked at the different uh, management methods and production methods and that really helped us sort out where we were heading because up until that point, most of what we knew was read out of a book and a lot of it came out of the old world, which, um, you know, uh, a lot of that still, people still climb trees for fruit harvest. So mechanisation is where we need to be. We need to look at, um, uh, you know, how, what we do with the biomass, uh, very large uh, carbon, um, uh, producers, date palms, so we're looking at effective ways to, uh, to um, value add that. Also learnt uh, the various production methods. Marketing opportunities, uh, America are mostly export orientated, but they do also have uh, very good um, uh, models where they sell their product uh, on, on, on roadside stalls. The other thing that we noticed uh, with date palms is uh, that there is the ability to intercrop and, and this, is, this is very common, particularly in the old world, where amongst the canopy of a date palm uh, there'll be fodder crops growing and uh, in, uh, this is the states, they'll grow citrus underneath the, the canopy of the date palms. Um, the old world, they'll shelter, they'll build their housing under their uh, livestock systems. Basically, the date palm is a pioneer plant species. It helps reduce the evapotranspiration rate below the canopy, and that allows for a lot of other crop types to, to, to uh, thrive in otherwise a fairly hot and arid environment. So, yeah, the, um, some of the photos, I'll flash a few up here now. These were some of the highlights. Um, Oman was just uh, incredible, and we've actually got quite a few of the Oman varieties. So uh, whilst ours are still at a juvenile stage, the Nuffield Scholarship gave me the opportunity to go and, and look at some of the other varieties um, that, they, that we haven't got yet and some, some varieties to which we have and look at how they're performing in those areas. Okay, I'm getting the wind up here, so I'll flash through these pretty quickly, but basically I, I think to, to summarise, uh, the, the date industry, we're in the nuclear stage of, a, of an industry uh, development program. Um, going over on the Nuffield Scholarship and seeing the amazing research and development programs that are occurring in these other countries and seeing examples of where other horticultural crops are being pulled out to favour date palms, um, looking at the pressures that we have on us in, in terms of adapting to climate change, I, I really do think that there's a good opportunity for this crop. Um, we still got to work our way out in terms of uh, selection picking the best varieties and adopting the best management um, protocols. But uh, early days it is, but we're very excited about what, um, what the future holds. So um, I'll wind it up there and um, thank you for your attention.